Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Miriam Vale, and I'm the artistic director of the Indie Memphis Film Festival. And um, I want to welcome you to our movie club. And we have a very special guest who will bring in very shortly. Um, but before we get started, I want to take a moment to say that we are in um, a very crucial crisis moment in our country. And we at Indie Memphis would like to offer all of our support to the brave truth tellers and revolutionaries who are fighting against the relentless assassination of black people in this country. And um, our heart goes out to them. We are doing all we can here to uh, keep doing what we're doing, which is supporting storytellers, um, supporting fighting against hacking narratives and narratives that are the same old narratives that we're seeing. And so we're very proud of the work we're doing supporting storytellers. And um, so if you are taking a moment to join us today of all days, we appreciate it. Um, and we're without further ado, let's get started on our conversation. Um, also just a quick note, when we uh, get to the Q&A portion, you can either use the raise hand option or you can type into the Q&A box. Um, if you're on YouTube, you can type into the comments and it will get to us. So now it is my great honor to bring the director of Desperately Seeking Susan and also, excuse me for being slow to, uh, there we go. So she'll be in in just one second. Um, she's the director of, oh, there she is, Susan Seidelman. Welcome, Susan. Hi, Miriam. Nice to be here. <laughs> Thank you. And I appreciate your opening remarks. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Um, I, uh, so Susan Seidelman is the director of the film that we'll be discussing today, Desperately Seeking Susan. Um, she's also uh, the director of Smithereens, one of the first American independent films to play the Cannes Film Festival. Um, she's directed Making Mr. Right, She Devil, and the pilot episode of Sex and the City, among many other film motion pictures. Um, and we'll be talking about Desperately Seeking Susan today and also some other films that are part of a, a subgenre that I called in 2012 the persona swap genre. And they're about uh, two women who in some way swap or merge identities. And um, Rachel Handler recently described Desperately Seeking Susan in Vulture as, um, as if someone got drunk on champagne and remade Persona. So I think that's a <laughs> great description. Uh, <laughs> and um, <laughs> and um, <laughs> And um, then uh, the, the film that, uh, one of the films that motivated this talk is a film by Jacques Rivette called uh, Celine and Julie Go Boating. And that is a film that was very difficult to see in America for the last 10, 15 years at least, um, if not longer, there hasn't been a proper DVD release, but Criterion uh, Channel just recently released it. Um, and so we, some of us who have loved the film have had a chance to, look at it again and hopefully people who haven't seen it will have a chance to discover it and um so let me jump in talking to you susan about that film this was a film written by well, your film desperately seeking susan was uh written by leora barish who had said that celine and julie was a direct yeah. inspiration so when you first read the script did you did it did you see that film in the bones of of desperately seeking susan I absolutely did. But let me go back to 1974, 1975, which was when I had first moved to, to New York City to go to NYU Film School, um, coming from the suburbs of Philadelphia. And uh, I remember going to the New York Film Festival. Growing up, I hadn't seen that many um, foreign films. And, uh, you know, I basically saw the suburban you know, whatever was playing at the suburban cinema. But when I went to see that film, it really blew my mind. I was a little bit um, uh, hesitant to go because I saw the running time was three hours and 20 minutes. So I was thinking, oh, that, that, that's, 
going to be challenging. But as soon as the film started, I was instantly intrigued because it was about a theme that uh, certainly something that I related to personally, which was um, kind of being bored or feeling out of place in where you came from and what you were doing with your life and, and looking for some sort of, of, of adventure, looking for something that would kind of push you in another direction. And um, so, so I, I, was, I was blown away by the film as I was when I saw it again on Criterion about three days ago. I hadn't seen it in a while. So that was just a, a, a wonderful experience. Um, and then when I read Desperately Seeking Susan, this is now 1983, I guess, when I first read it, I recognized so many elements from that film that they, 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 were, they weren't borrowed from, they were like an homage to uh, that film, but certainly the theme of one woman who is somewhat dissatisfied in her life and sees this exotic creature and decides to follow her down the rabbit hole into another more exciting world which is um, very much the theme of, of Desperately Seeking Susan. When I rewatched the film again a couple of days ago, I had forgotten how many sort of plot points, uh, especially in the first half of Celine and Julie, were um, you know, inspired plot points in, in Desperately Seeking Susan. Um, big plot points and small plot points. Um, uh, so that was kind of surprising to me because I had totally, you know, I knew it was influenced by, but I didn't realize how much it was influenced by that movie. And again, we've never tried to pretend the fact that, that it wasn't a, a big influence, but everything from the kind of opening scene where we see the character of Julie, who's kind of the bored conservative character sitting in a, a, a park bench. Maybe she's on her lunch break. I don't know. She looks like she's wearing work clothes and sensible shoes. Uh, reading a book about magic, which instantly tells the audience she wants to go somewhere. She's bored. Um, and then she sees this exotic character who's running across the park and becomes and drops a scarf and she becomes intrigued by that character and begins to follow her. If you look at Desperately Seeking Susan, the opening, the introduction of the Roberta character played by Roseanne Arquette is again, a, a bored suburban housewife who's sitting in a, in a hair salon, uh, reading a, a, a personal ad, following the romantic adventures of this more exotic creature, which she will eventually meet and then follow down the, the rabbit hole. Um, there were tons of other, I, we can go through all the other details, but I was, I was just so surprised by the amount of uh, cross-pollinization. <laughs> well, one of the big ones is um, magic, is that uh, one of the big visual clues is that the um, Celine character and Susan, um, both titles in the film as in the films as well. I love a good, I love all, movies with women's titles, women's names in the titles. Yeah, that could be yeah. another genre. Um, but the both of these women are mis magicians as well as Julie reading a book on magic. There right. and and um, there's we see the scenes of um, uh, of and you replicate that where you see the other woman replicate the magician in right. the magic club. But your magic club I noticed is, um, it also differentiates uh, where your film goes. Your film is a tight 140 minutes. That film is three hours and 15 minutes. Yeah. Uh, they have completely different paces. Yeah. And your film feels very like, uh, the adventure feels very old fashioned, you know, more like a classic, uh, no, what it was was inspired by a screwball comedy. By I, I, I like taking old or genres and then twisting them, whether it's a sci-fi genre or a mafia comedy or a revenge comedy. In this case, it was a screwball comedy where 
uh, interestingly enough, the, you know, the device of amnesia, I mean, I wasn't taking amnesia that she seriously had, you know, an amnesia problem. It was a clearly a wink, wink, nudge, nudge device to allow her to enter an, into another more exciting world. And in both those movies, the passive character, the initially passive character, gets to kind of go to this exotic club, dress up in a more uh, liberating way, um, and live out a, a, a fantasy. And, um, you know, uh, so I think that the club is, is almost like Wonderland in Alice in Wonderland. It's a place where you can kind of meet wacky people or, or, or do wacky things and allow your inner rebelliousness or your inner creativity to come out. That's so interesting about the screwball comedy. I adore screwball comedies. And that's something in re-looking at your, and, and in screwball comedies, the amnesia device is completely classic. <laughs> uh, Absolutely. Um, but, but also in, in uh, screwball comedies like Preston Sturgis, uh, you know, twins, you know, somebody always has a twin brother and there's a mistaken identity. I mean, all those kinds of devices I find fun to play with, especially when they have a resonance that goes deeper than just the gimmick. You know, I mean, in, again, Amnesia was a gimmick, so to speak, to allow Roberta to free herself of her suburban bourgeois middle-class restraints, so she restraints, so she could be somebody else. In the same way that the gimmick in, in, in Celine and Julie is they both pop these candies, you know, which transports them into another world. I mean, no one's saying they're they're taking acid or you know, we don't know what those candies do, but they just pop a candy and instantly they're in another reality. And another example of that, which inspired, I think, both Desperately Seeking Susan and um, Celine and Julie is Alice in Wonderland, where she goes down the rabbit hole, uh, sees a bottle, you know, drinks it, sees a piece of cake, I think it is, that says, eat me eats it and she she alters her reality yes there's a, a reference in Celine and julie to a direct reference to alice in wonderland i think in the scene when um julia berto um the Celine character is talking to her friends and you can vouch for desperately seeking susan if alice in wonderland is a reference then yeah, yeah. we believe you um yeah. that's it's interesting about the screwball comedy to me too because in re-watching some of your other films I noticed there are so many film so many scenes in your films of people watching old movies old sci-fi movies old yeah. like it's in it's a consistent theme yeah. and that yeah. makes sense that both you and Rivette are um are film lovers are cinephiles but it comes mm -hmm. through in different ways so I think with yeah. him the the narr you're both playing with narrative and in your film the two women switch narratives and they are dealing with the narratives of their own life. While yeah. in Celine and Julie, they're jumping into a narrative um, of this whole other uh, mystery and in the right. house. And, right. um, and I think that's interesting too. I, something I wanted to ask you is um, once you got the script, uh, did you make any significant changes um, or was it, did you feel like you, um, can you tell me anything about that, about how it changed from the time you read it till the yeah. film, finished film? Yeah, it, 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 it did go through significant changes and there were, you know, the, the hardest part is, is um, coming up with a device or a, 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 let's call it a MacGuffin that propels you through the story, that allows the story, because I am a narrative filmmaker and Yishap Rivet is way more experimental or avant-garde in his sensibility than I am. But I, you know, so, so uh, we were looking for, Leora Barish and I were looking for a device that would keep the story moving and give the, the, the women a motivation to get from scene to scene to scene. In this case, it was this device about the, Egypt, the, the jacket with the pyramid and the stolen Egyptian earrings. The, again, trying to refer to magic and magical you know, symbols. Um, so, uh, but in some earlier drafts, I think that there was 
uh, oh, everything from a, a, a guitar that had been belonged to some, you know, an expensive guitar that had belonged to some famous rocker, I forget who it was, but, you know, there was some other device. I think at one point there was a postcard, the Magic Club postcard had a stamp on it that was very valuable and that was being sought after by gangsters, but of course that's a plot out of, is it Charade or Charade? Uh, all right. One, one, <laughs> there was a, an expensive stamp in, in, in one of those old movies. But until we found the right device that could pull you through the story, but didn't take too much explanation and didn't take up too much time, because really what you, you wanted to spend your time with these two women and just watch them go about their adventures. And you wanted to watch their lives uh, we, you know, crisscross. Uh, one of the big difference between Celine and Julie and, and, and Desperately Seeking Susan is Celine and Julie have a relationship together. They go through this outside adventure in the, let's call it the spooky house. You know, uh, um, they, they, they go through it together. Whereas in Desperately Seeking Susan, the, as you said, the adventure is outside of them, but they impact on each other's life. So what Madonna or, or Susan does, has done, um, affects Roberta, Roseanne Arquette, whereas they're not really interacting with each other except in the very beginning when they meet and Roberta follows Susan and it gets the jacket. And then at the very end, when they come together again, having uh, um, gotten the bad guy. I think in one version too, there's a, there was a, um, I think I've seen footage of where they go off to um, Egypt together or something for further adventures. Was that was a considered ending at one point? There, we, we filmed that ending. There was, there was an ending where we see them both it, uh, on camels in the desert. It was actually filmed in a sand pit in New Jersey and the camels <laughs> I think we got from the zoo. <laughs> but but what, what happened was, although that was a wonderful event, you know, it was wonderful image to see them together in the desert with a pyramid in the background that we were going to um, kind of paint in. Um, um, one of the things that when we started showing, having screenings of the film, we realized that the film had multiple endings. They had an ending where they get the bad guy. They had an ending where they solve, they, they, they win a reward for the stolen Egyptian earrings. And then there was another ending where we see their, their respective boyfriends in a bar bemoaning the fact that the girls have gone off, the women have gone off <laughs> on an adventure. Then we see them in the, the adventure. So there were like four scenes that, oh, sorry. And then we had the ending in the, in the movie theater where they're both in the movie theater watching the bad sci-fi movie and the, the uh, celluloid burns. So we had a lot of endings. And <laughs> we had a kind of pick one of them, um, yeah. So three was okay, five was a little too many. Yeah, a little too much. <laughs> a little too yeah. much, that makes sense. But it's still sort of the, um, I think you, you, to see them together in the, in the um, when they get the award and you know, yeah. you kind of can project on uh, that that's, that's coming. I mean, one thing that, another difference that I find interesting is that, um, that your film, um, that in Celine and Julie, there are scenes that are so satisfying of the two women, like really just swapping their role, the, um, uh, the, the sort of naughty Madonna kind of character in this film, um, uh, Julia Berto Celine replaces, um, goes to meet Julie's old boyfriend. And that's such a wonderful scene. And yeah. you really take that further in a way that is so satisfying, like the scenes of Madonna in the suburban house with the yeah. cheese yeah. puffs and the Cheetos and those yeah. Yeah. And, the and, and they do exchange their lives, although they're not doing it in the same scene, they are doing it not, you know, uh, anyway, and, and um, that scene with Madonna and uh, Mark Blum, who sadly passed away this year from COVID, uh, yeah. who plays um, the husband, um, you know, are the equivalent of seeing uh, Juliet Berthold uh, with uh, Julie's boring boyfriend. 
Yes. And it's really, I mean, I think as a woman director to emphasize that, that switching role, it's sort of, um, I don't know, it's, it's satisfying in a way that I can't quite even name. It's, it's really wonderful. And we see that in some of, I mean, maybe that's a good place to talk about um, uh, some of the other films we were talking about for this discussion and persona swap films. Um, mm. You can see that swapping roles in these in these films, it's quite freewheeling and imaginative, and obviously magic is part of it. Another film that we mentioned, um, where the adventure um, is emphasizes daisies. Another film mm -hmm. by a woman director, um, uh, Vera, uh, whose last name I always I, I won't say right now because I think I always I, 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 I actually love, wrote it down because I couldn't. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> So embarrassing. I've missed uh, that. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I've always mispronounced it. Um, and um, and uh, but then we also see films. Um, a recent film, uh, Ingrid Goes West, yeah. which is another film about two yeah. women and very yeah. overtly about one woman assuming yeah. the identity of the other. And that film takes quite darker turns and you mentioned that when I mentioned this discussion as yeah. a film that you found interesting do you yeah. want to mention what 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 drew you to that film what did you find interesting about yeah, it yeah again I I do like um films about one woman who becomes obsessed with another woman and is curious about her life and I did watch that again uh recently and it, it, it is a much darker film and one of the things, and it's a social comment about our need for, you know, in social media, our need to be liked, our need to project a certain image. And, um, and, and what was sad about that movie, fascinating though, was uh, the one character um, played by Aubrey Plaza, mm -hmm. um, the main character, Ingrid, who has just lost her mother, who's really whose life is she's lonely and sad and her life just very little in her life except to spend all her time watching reading people's posts on I guess it was Facebook back then you know and liking them or Instagram whatever um, and becomes obsessed with this Instagram or Facebook influencer who seems to be living this perfect life um, I think what why that was so sad is because the the story of that is not that the influencer played by uh the the perfect the perfect lady um uh, played by elizabeth olsen uh she's a phony <laughs> so in in celine and julie and in desperately seeking susan the characters of these exotic free willing people they're not they may lie and manipulate which they do they're users and you know have uh you know certain you know bad qualities but they also have they're genuine they're genuine phonies it's kind of like in that <laughs> line in in, in 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 breakfast at tiffany's where somebody calls holly go Ludley a phony but at least she's a genuine phony and and that's <laughs> the difference in in um uh, uh ingrid goes west the character of uh, uh played by elizabeth olsen is a sad phony. She's everything about her is phony. There's not a genuine thing about her, and so to become obsessed with a, uh, a total phony <laughs> is what makes it so sad. And 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 what she becomes obsessed about is all the superficial accoutrements of that woman's life, her home, her, you know, the uh, teapot she uses, the lamp she bought, you know, all these status symbols, as opposed to what is interesting about that person as a person. And, and so it, it, it ends up sadly uh, with then a, a kind of, sort of happy ending at a uh, happy moment at the end where she the sad character gets to, to be authentic I don't want to ruin it for anyone who hasn't seen it but I definitely would recommend that if you like persona swap films uh Ingrid goes west you should see and Aubrey Plaza's performance is is so brave and so bold um yeah, definitely it's so good. It's so good. Everyone yeah. is so good in that film. And yeah. The writing yeah. is so 
um, so it's, sharp. it's so sharp. It's funny. I, I know quite a few critics who all feel like that film got overlooked a bit. I think maybe because yeah. it's about Instagram and starring two women, it feels maybe people think it's lighter than it is, uh, yeah. but that it's, it, you know, and I think that happens. I think that, yeah. that really happens. Yeah. In that film. I was going to say I that you go back to um sorry yeah. Daisy's for a second. Um, for me, uh, what is wonderful about Daisy's because it's not a, a a persona swap film. It's a it's a female friendship. Girls just want to have fun film. And what is so wonderful about it is that it's so bold and daring and audacious uh, the way the girls just want to have fun. And of course, that's coming out of it, the, the film was made in, I think, 1966 in Czechoslovakia. So it's really a, a, a middle finger, giving a middle finger to the Soviet, uh, the, the Soviet restrictive uh, uh, world, uh, you know, restricting artistic expression, political expression. Um, the, the, the film rebels against all that. And also, even though I think Vera Chitalova, was that? And that's it, that's it. You said <laughs> it right. <laughs> me to use this word it's, it's a feminist film although she probably is so uh wouldn't, wouldn't like to be categorized categorized in that way but um the women uh, you know also are so uh it's a film about not being restrained by any gender uh, political artistic restraints restraints and the film the style of the film itself is so bold and refreshing. It's not quite a, a narrative. It's more like little wild vignettes all strung together. Um, but I'm sure that's an intentional uh, uh, rebellion against traditional narrative film, especially at that time, you know, pre 1966, which was, you know, Czech New Wave, but before that, everything was probably very much controlled by the Soviet regime and had a, a, a nice communist, in the Soviet sense, message and, you know, everything was probably, you know, I'm sure censored by the the political, you know, the board, the artistic board. So this really was a, um, a, a definite act of rebellion, almost in a, in a kind of punk, punk sort of way or, or riot girl sort of way. No, absolutely. And it's such a, and it, riot girl is very true. It's a very, it's a very like, um, it's a, it's a very strong depiction of like female friendship that you wouldn't see necessarily a male friendship depicted that way. Yeah. Um, and when you first saw Celine and Julie Goes Boating back at the New York Film Festival, um, and you, you said it resonated so much, you know, I, I had the same experience when I rewatched it on Criterion Channel. I could remember hearing the, the music and seeing the soundtrack in exactly the theater I was in when I first saw it. Yeah. And it really has yeah. that effect of sort of one of those films. Yeah. And so was it, obviously it was the storytelling in the story and had you seen very many depictions of women's relationships like that, do you think in films? I, I hadn't at that time. Um, at, towards the end of the seventies and early eighties, I was starting to see, I mean, clearly there were some indie filmmakers and certainly European filmmakers um, that were exploring, that had suddenly had the ability to explore, to tell stories of their own. I mean, when you think about it, the, 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 the female friendship or girls just want to have fun kind of stories. In the past, it was usually, you know, in the 50s or early 60s, you know, there, there was the bad girl and the good girl. You know, that was sort of it. Or if there were two girls having fun together, it was on a beach, they were having fun together until one of them found a boyfriend. <laughs> and then the, the plot of the movie, you know, those Sandra D or um, Annette Funicello beach movies, you know, the plot then became about the relationship with the, with the boyfriend. Um, but there, there weren't, there were very few depictions because very few women were making movies. 
Right, of course. Um, yeah, so and there I are a lot of guy depictions of guy. You know, obviously the buddy buddy thing. You know, I I watched um, on I think it was on Criterion uh, a um, a early Fellini movie. I'm going to say it wrong, but Il Vitelloni. That's it. Yeah, guys, right. Which is all yeah. about the relationship between these guys, and I think the film was made in 1951 and. Clearly, when you look at that, you can see the influence that must have had that that film must have had for like Scorsese, you know, when he did Mean Streets. And but it was always about the guys, <laughs> you know. Maybe yeah. there was a girl that got pregnant, you know, somewhere in the in the in the story. But um, uh, the 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 first time really that I started to see depictions of women friendship stories, I think early when I was in film school and it was probably in the mid to late 70s was a film called Girlfriends and I think it was directed by Claudia Weil. I, I haven't seen it in a long time so I can't remember the specifics but I remember loving it because it was a story I hadn't seen before. It's a film I love. I love Claudia Weil. I love the film. I've just, I, it's a film that I'm always insisting people see and I would love to do one of these discussions soon with her um, but yeah it's really and it was to have discovered that film I think 10 years ago and realize it hadn't been in my life all that time before was a little yeah. heartbreaking I think people are discovering it more again you know something in this discussion something that's becoming clear to me whether the sort of um, the darker side of this persona swap film of Ingrid Goes West or films that um, like uh, Persona or um, Mulholland Drive or Single White Females, a classic kind of right. like dark side, um, or these female friendship, girls just want to have fun. I think that the overriding theme, um, the connection besides the, the swapping and the merging is a romance. It's a romance between women and it's not necessarily a sexual romance. In fact, mm -hmm. some of the, the male directors make it sexual when it doesn't necessarily have to be that. But mm -hmm. in your film, in watching what you said about how those opening scenes you were so inspired by Celine and Julie and there's you know it's about one woman pursuing another down the mm -hmm. street in this mm -hmm. way that is just it's like a crush it's pure romance in yeah. a way that we don't see very often yeah I, I definitely think that Roberta had a girl crush on the Susan character Madonna and what I think was um, kind of so interesting, you know, with sort of life paralleling art or whatever, is that, uh, you know, Madonna, who was not well known when we started filming the movie, uh, shortly thereafter, you know, the whole world, at least every young and old woman that I knew at that time, you know, was a sort of Madonna wannabe, you know, whether it was the way she looked, the sassiness of her style, so that real life in some way uh, sort of coincided with, with movie life. We all became Roberta's yeah. <laughs> following her. I, you know, something about the way that she has that crush on Madonna, it also echoes Ingrid Goes West. And I realized um, in rewatching Desperately Seeking Susan that it's almost like, proto um social media because instead of following her on instagram yeah. she's following her in the personal pages exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's the same thing of someone being bored but and then by the time we get to ingrid goes west everyone's bored everyone's following everyone and so you get these yeah. complete phonies who say they've read joan didion when they haven't <laughs> right, in, right, ingrid goes west. right. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting in context with those other films. Something we, if we talk about, um, uh, uh, if we talk about the romance between the women, um, and then what role do you think the men play then in relationship to that romance? Like it's, I mean, as far as the way that you develop the story, because they do have these romance, these, these um, relationships with other men, but yet somehow this romance between the two women is centralized. How was that something that you thought about in the way that you made this film? Or did yeah, it just come well, out naturally? Think about, I mean, it definitely is a love story or a, a crush story between 
um, Roberta and Susan and the guys are sidekicks. I mean, yeah. think about how many movies you've seen where the, you know, it's about men and their buddies and then they have girlfriends that are like their second, the sidekick, you know, the, the, the secondary character. Although, I mean, the, the, the characters were important so I didn't want to make them total um, cardboard characters. I mean, I think you, you wanted to make them authentic and, and real, but but those romances definitely are secondary to this story of the two women. Uh, that's why yeah. it was, um, you know, easier to cast the women because more women wanted to play those roles. Uh, you know, usually, you know, in, in the world of casting, the, the men have, you know, before this, the men have the great parts, certainly up until fairly recently, maybe the last 10 years or so, for the most part, the men had the juicy parts and the women took those other parts. They were fun, they were interesting, and maybe it would get them another movie down the line. Of course, <laughs> I'm being a little cynical here, but, um, uh, you know, obviously that's changing now because clearly the, the, the more women that are making movies, the more female stories are being told, the more personal stories of all kinds, of all people who have been underrepresented in, in cinema for all these years. And, uh, you know, it's about time. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, it's interesting in talking to you that these tropes that we see, you know, of the, the good girl, bad girl, your film really like, just goes in on those and they neither of them are the good girl bad girl you know that's yeah. really playing yeah. with the tropes that in yeah. before had been sidelined so are you saying in what you were just saying that it was hard to cast the men because men didn't want to play the they wouldn't didn't want to play second fiddle there, there were some issues about that i mean um <laughs> we got some great guys and they were up and coming guys but we wouldn't have gotten a movie star an established movie star or even an established leading man with you know uh, at that time because it wasn't the lead role it wasn't a lead role so uh, i'm i'm totally you know grateful that we got some great guys in there um, but it was much easier to cast the women. I mean, there were a lot of actresses who wanted to play uh, that part, particularly the Susan part. Oh, well, you got the perfect Susan. I mean, <laughs> I can't imagine it. Without... Something else, I, I'm gonna open it up to questions in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, and so please, if you have questions, use the Q&A box or the comments box on YouTube or you can raise your hand and we can call on you and you can ask a question directly. But another difference that I noticed is that, I mean, no offense to Rivette, the clothes are much better in your movie. And then you know, there's some, and I noticed that in general, clothes seem to be very important in your films. And do you wanna talk about the importance of clothes in this film? I mean, obviously clothes are important because we're talking about swapping identities and there's the great jacket. So. Right. Can you talk about, because um, also in Smithereens, clothes are important and, and a lot of your films. I, I think, um, you know, my background was, I originally thought I wanted to be a designer, but that didn't last that long. But I think what I always felt was interesting about co clothing and production design in general is that you're able to say a lot of things with a quick image. Um, like, like, uh, I'll give you an example. And Celine and Julie, she's wearing sensible shoes. She's running up and down long flights of, of, of stairs, uh, going up to, I guess, the Sacre Coeur or Montmartre, you know, huge stairs. And she's wearing these sort of brown, chunky, sensible shoes with thick heels. And so you say, that's a sensible girl, you know, um, instantly. Or you look at um, Roberta Rosanna Arquette's clothing in the, in the beginning of the, the, the first scene where we really realize she's unhappy in her suburban birthday party. And she's wearing like a little pastel frilly dress. And you go, I know that person, I know, who she is, I know what kind of house she lives in, I know what her husband's gonna be like and what kind of car she's gonna drive because you've got an, an image of her instantly. And of course, the same with Madonna when we first see her in her Madonna-esque attire. 
Um, and the same also with Juliette Berthaud playing, um, sorry, Cecile, right? You, you know she's a free spirit. She's wearing some sort of boa scarf around her neck. <laughs> Uh, so it's, it's just a, a, an easy way of defining a character without having too much, too much dialogue um, to describe. Something else I really like about your style and, and other films and including this one is you are unafraid of pink. Like the difference between the magic clubs is your production design and your magic club is so astounding. And you really, um, that's very pink but then so there's so much pink in um roberta's home too but it's sort of different shades of pink from that well, pastel pink, about pink um look at she devil i mean i was movie. gonna say <laughs> movie, and that's also a movie with two women very opposite who in 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 a different fashion because it's a revenge comedy but in in a different fashion whose lives intersect and what one does impacts on the other and yet at the end i'd like to th I, I do think that they both come out better um the the powerless housewife played by uh, uh, uh Roseanne Barr. is is powerful and and is leading an army of working women at the very end of the movie and the frivolous superficial phony uh, Mary Fisher character, the romance novelist, at the very end of the of the film, ends up writing a serious novel and um, uh, taking her work a little bit more seriously, and and it's rewarded. So uh, again, that theme of how opposites can kind of impact on each other, and in I guess because I'm an optimistic person in some way I'd like to think without a kind of corny happy ending or you know it can be corny but it has to have some social relevance you know that there's some that women impacting other women is a good thing <laughs> so I, so I want the endings to be even if there's a touch of irony in there I want them to be kind of positive and I think in these films too, it's like as a viewer, they're, um, they can feel like two sides of yourself, two sides of the same woman, I think. Um, and, and I think to see those two sides uh, mm -hmm. interact and swap is, is, um, is really fascinating. I, I think she devil is great. And then also uh, you do doubles in a film called Making Mr. Right with John Malkovich playing two roles, <laughs> which is really yeah. charming. Right, right. Yeah. I'm going to open it up to questions before we get too far on that. Um, oh, here's a perfect question. Speaking of twins, um, I couldn't help get excited when I saw the cameo by the triplets from the Doc Three Identical Strangers. Just curious if there are any anecdote on how they were cast or if they were already famous in New York by the time of production. They weren't already famous, and it's very interesting how they were cast. We were filming. It was the, the, the scene where um, Madonna goes to place a personal ad, desperately seeking strangers, seeking Susan, or something like that. It's towards the end when she's sort of wearing white garters and <laughs> white, white fishnets and driving Gary's car. So we were setting up to film that, that shot where she pulls up in the car. And, you know, again, this is a film about doubling, I guess. They're walking down the street, just walking down the street with three triplets, just like <laughs> <laughs> walking down the street, just alike. And it turned out that I don't know what they were doing in the street. They may have been at some casting audition someplace else in another building nearby. But when I saw them, actually, somebody pointed them out to me. And when I saw them, I said, let's just we have to put them in the movie they're so appropriate for this uh for this particular scene so we literally grabbed them and and had them stand up against the doorway there and again of course at that time i they, they weren't famous and i did not know what their story and what the story of their life was was going to be and that was a very moving uh interesting documentary but uh yeah they were walking down the street that's amazing. I'm so glad that question was asked. Um, okay, so there's another question. Um, let's see. Uh, 
I wonder, so this is a question from Julian Myers. I wonder if you talk more about this distinction uh, between movies about male female identity swaps versus persona swap films between two women. What makes the distinction necessary important? This is a complicated question, but as an old movie fan, I know that there are some of those films where like women and men swap role, um, uh, um, none of the ideas are coming right. Or even like Wait, that's a common- I, I yeah, I I don't, I don't know many of those. I, I can't, if, if, if she would give an example, maybe I could comment. I do remember Victor Victoria vaguely, right. but I don't remember much about that movie. And I'm trying to think of other, I mean, Tootsie, of course, where he plays a, a woman and then becomes feminized as a result. And he does it for, to, to get work for you know work and economic artistic and economic reasons and then ends up actually learning a lot about being a woman as a result um but i think that's a different category of of, of uh, identity swapping i think so too there's an older film i can't think of the title right now and it's it, it fits more in there but i think what this question makes me think of too is that you do see that a little bit in screwball comedies like bringing up baby there's not necessarily they don't swap identity completely but um there's uh you see um the Katherine Hepburn character starts wearing pants more and then eventually right. yeah um uh, Cary Grant wears a feather dressing gown and they're sort of like they swap and I think that that's a common thing in screwball comedies so again that's really interesting that that was a uh, a, um, an influence on this. They do remind me of like Carl Lombard or um, Jean Arthur, or these well, people. All the, um, I mean, think about all the Catherine Hepburns, uh, Spencer Tracy, where it's sort of male, male versus female and they, uh, the, the woman sort of takes on characteristics that we traditionally associate with male and 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 probably the the the, the male character becomes sensitized in some way to his female side yeah so that absolutely in, in screwball comedy was a was an ongoing theme okay yeah um um yeah i love knowing that so there's here's another question uh uh that susan you mentioned that madonna wasn't a big star at the beginning of filming um was it always a plan to use the song into the groove and release that as part of the film? And I think you directed the music video or was the music video mostly from clips from the mostly film? Mostly from, mostly okay. from, yeah. Again, you know, sometimes things are just, I, I, I think that in filmmaking you, you need, especially in Desperate Sequences, and we did have everything, we wanted, you know, it's a puzzle. It's a movie that has all these pieces that have to fit together. So you have to be pretty planned out about how you're going to film things and what's going to what's going to follow what and what's going to transition into what. Um, on on the other hand, I think you have to be open to uh, to life, just like with the triplets walking down the street. The 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 the, the music, the, the Into the Groove song, that was, we were filming in Dance at Cheery. It was the dance club scene where the Madonna character meets um, Roseanne Arquette's husband at, at Dance at Cheery. And Madonna came in that morning and she had a, um, a cassette. It wasn't even a final cassette. It was just like a song she was working on. And she said, can we, put this on to get the crowd dancing because the way you, when you film a dance scene is you start the music going, everyone starts dancing so they're dancing in sync to a beat. You then turn the music off so that the actors can say their lines and you know there, there's no music behind them. So we, we use that tape she brought in, literally just a cassette. Um, and uh, then in the editing, you know, we, we put it in as temp music because that was the beat everyone was dancing to. And then sometimes when you put temp music into a, a film you're working in, you are working on, you start to fall in love with it. So we fell in love with it. And then lo and behold, M Madonna and her first album, um, I guess Like a Virgin, uh, came out and was a huge hit. I don't even know if Into the Groove was on that album or not, but uh, 
maybe or maybe not. But she, be, her songs became so popular. So then uh, the studio, Orion Pictures said, well, we, we, we got to stick it in there. But it was just started out as temp music. She could have brought in another song that day or somebody else could have brought on it, uh, in another song and that song might have ended up in the, in the film. <laughs> That's incredible to hear such a, a song that became such a such a an iconic classic as just a tape on temp music. That's great. Um, yeah. Did Madonna bring anything? Something about the Rivette film is that it's been documented that the two lead actresses did was directed by a man, uh, Selena and Julie goes voting, um, but he worked a lot with the actresses and they brought a lot to their characters and to the story. Your yeah. film, on the other hand, was written and directed by women, produced by women. It was yeah. really kind of a milestone, I think, at the time um, for a film so completely um, made by women and um, did, um, so you already brought a lot to it from your own experiences, but did Madonna and Rosanna Arquette, I think um, especially Madonna, did she add things to her character or was that pretty much all on the script? The dialogue, you know, screwball comedy, the, the, the dialogue has to be pretty tight and sharp because right. it needs a certain pace. So the, the lines for the most part were as scripted and it was really important that, you know, there's, there's setups and punchlines. So you want everything to be pretty tight. However, the action, some of the action was not scripted. So some of, or one or two of the more I iconic moments like um you know madonna with her drying her armpits with the uh in the bathroom with the hair dryer on the wall was an improvised thing she improvised that there was a hair amazing lower on the wall <laughs> <laughs> did that um you know little things like rosanna with a cigarette looking sick and coughing after she smoked the cigarette that's an actor bringing their their charm and their instinct to those roles um but the dialogue was pretty tightly scripted but the one exception was um a scene that we did with a taxi cab driver, a guy named Rocket's Red Glare, who was sort of a downtown indie film uh, actor. It was in a lot of Jim Jarmusch movies. And um, he says something about uh, he about sushi. I took it home, cooked it, tasted like fish. <laughs> Funny line, that was it, <laughs> not scripted. <laughs> That makes sense for the two styles too, but that's great to know about the hand dryer. Um, so I think this is probably going to be the last question we have. If you have, um, if you have a question, this is your last chance to get in. Otherwise, we will um, end with this question from Oscar Garzon, who wants to know if you can talk about Susan the first time you saw Bergman's Persona and um, your reaction to it, how it might have inspired you, and or or not. You know, I would like to, I, I would love to answer that question, but I saw the film so long ago. I saw it when I was uh, actually a film student and um, what was it, B.B. Anderson and Leave Ohm, uh, Leave Ullman, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I remember their amazing performances and I remember that great shot where their, their images, their faces merged together. Um, but I don't remember much of the, the storyline or the character. So I, I'm sorry, I can't say more about that. I'd be curious what you, I recently rewatched it and it's a film that it's like, so magnificent, but I have um, conflicting feelings about it, about the way they, you know, the depiction of these two uh, women friendships. Like it seems, I mean, not a friendship really at all. It's like about, um, you know, it's very much from the perspective mm. of a man being attracted to these two women <laughs> and what that's like in his relationship. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's magnificent, some of the scenes. Um, um, but yeah, that film and some of the other films we uh, discussed, um, we've been uh, recommending them. Um, also, Daisies, another film we didn't mention is Three Women, um, a terrific film, yeah. development film. Yeah. And um, so we'll, uh, <coughs> we'll be recommending these and sending links of where you can watch them on VOD. Oh, go ahead. 
Oh, I was going to say, and one other film that I would recommend also about, uh, you know, it's not, well, uh, it's not a persona swap, but it is a kind of swap. And that's all about Eve. Oh, right. Which, yeah. which is. Uh, um, right. I mean, that's another one. Too. Yeah. That's very related to persona, maybe like it's uh, the, um, like one woman being substituted for the other, like competition yeah. is, is so key in that. Um, yeah, that's a film that I haven't seen in a while that I should mm -hmm. rewatch. Um, well, I wanna thank you so much for joining us. This was, I, I told you, I, this film was coming out, Celine and Julie, uh, for the first time. And I thought, who do I wanna talk about this film, a favorite film of mine? And you were my absolute number one dream to talk about this film with. Uh, so it was just such a delight. Thank you so much for joining thank us. You. I enjoyed the conversation and I enjoyed watching the film again because of you. So thank you. <laughs> oh, wonderful. All right, guys, we'll be back um, next Tuesday. Bye, Susan. And bye, bye everyone. Thanks for joining.